Hello, everyone. What a gorgeous day. Thank you for coming in. I want to introduce Tom Denenberg to you. I'm sure you know who he is. And he's been here probably one of our most invited speakers over the course of our 34 years. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Thomas Denenberg is the John Wilmerding Director and CEO of Shelburne Museum. Prior to moving to Vermont in 2011, he served as the Chief Curator and Deputy Director of the Portland Museum of Art, Richard Koopman, Curator of American Decorative Arts at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, and Betsy Maine Babcock, Curator of American Art at Reynolds, Rinalda. Rinalda House or Reynolds House? Rinalda, Rinalda House. Tom received a BA in history from Bates College and earned his PhD in American Studies from Boston University. Fellow at the National Museum of American History and taught at Boston University, Harvard, and Wake Forest. He's a frequent lecturer and has written extensively on the retrospective culture of New England. Please give a warm welcome again to Tom Denenberg. I'm going to go home and tell my daughter that I am the most requested uh, <laughs> and see if that gets me any, uh, any cookie points. Um, thank you so much. A little, little feedback. Thank you, Travis. But I always get a kick out of uh, coming and speaking to this group because um, I think it's a little bit like preaching to the choir. Um, everyone knows Shelburne Museum, and um, everyone sort of loves the loves the topic and the content. So it's always it's always a fun afternoon. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm sure everyone would rather be in their garden today because um, it is one of the epic days of uh, of the year out there. Um, what I wanted to do today is complicate the myth of the railroad in American culture, and I wanted to do that by asking you to think about technology and how people interact with technology and change. And I want to kind of put out there that I don't think there's a single invention or technological advancement in American history that rivals the railroad for what it has done to the cultural topography of the United States, the social geography of the United States. Um, and last time I said that, somebody said, well, wait, what about the internet? Um, and the last few years where we've all been at home Zooming with, with each other, and I said, fine, that's a great rival to the idea of the railroad, but in fact, it's literally ethereal. Um, it's literally allowing us to kind of stay in place, whereas what the railroad did was pushed European settlers from the East Coast West through the now kind of questionable theory of manifest destiny, um, past the Rockies, you know, from sort of coast to coast. So I don't think there is a single bit of technology um, that has had a more dramatic impact on our lives than the railroad, really from the 1830s until um, the present day. And having said all that, I want you to kind of keep a, a pendulum in your head um, while we're talking and looking at a bunch of images. And that pendulum, um, I would like you to think of as being sort of a spectrum between progress and nostalgia. Um, because I think that's really the whole story with looking at the way in which artists have interacted with the railroad, with trains, with this new, tech, new technology. And having asked you to keep, I think, what, two or three things in your mind uh, already with this, I'm going to put yet another sort of point on the exam, which won't be coming, um, uh, which is to think deeply along the way um, for the next 45 minutes or so about the, um, the interaction of artists with the technology. When we set out to do this project, this exhibition, um, we literally, on the back of a napkin, um, my colleagues at the Dixon Gallery and the Jocelyn Museum in Omaha, Nebraska, Dixon's in Memphis, we were just putting these broad themes down in American art. Um, and, um, and one of the questions we asked ourselves is, what, what are the themes that painters, that artists interacted with? Um, and from the very beginning, it's fascinating to me the, the dialectic or the conversation between painters and um, the railroad. It starts from the very beginning. Um, same thing happens with writers, by the way, and we'll talk about that as we, as we get underway. Um, I want to start 
with a Thomas Cole painting. And this is River in the Catskills. This is from the collection of the MFA Boston from 1843. Um, Thomas Cole, many of you may recognize his name, was born in 1801, dies in 1848, is really the father figure, the leader, the captain of what we eventually would call the Hudson River School um, of American painting, the sort of group of artists mostly based in New York um, who took British landscape traditions, and Cole himself was English, very, you know, proudly born in England, um, and translated this to this new, to the new world. So they took the, you know, the, the sort of painting that you would uh, come across Constable or others in the, in the early 19th century in, in England, um, but they translated it to the conditions of the new world. Um, and something we'll talk about as we move, move forward there is this fantasy of the new world as a, you know, as a wilderness and a fantasy of the new world as kind of a, a Garden of Eden, an Edenic um, place. Very, very different from the England that Thomas Cole knew, which by the time he was born already was in the throes of the Industrial Revolution. And you will have you know, English poets writing about, oh, perfect, thank you. Um, probably much better, yeah, perfect, thank you. Writing about you know, dark satanic mills and and you know, people are already punching their, their time clock to go to factories in England. So Cole and um, those Englishmen who came to the United States in the early Republic found something very much like this Catskill scene. When we put the exhibition together, we were um, very, very influenced by a book called The Machine in the Garden. Um, and this is a, a literary history of the United States by a fellow named Leo Marx who points out that so many of the um, writers of the 1820s, 30s, and 40s uh, were fascinated by this dichotomy or declension between this new technology that's showing up in, um, in the landscape. So in the case of coal, we see it very dramatically. This looks, I mean, it could be a British landscape, but in this case, it's the Catskills, um, which is you know, close enough for an artist from New York City to get to, kind of the artist as tourist. But then what we see is just the train beginning to kind of poke into the landscape. So rather than directly call this machine in the garden in the exhibition, we decided to call it smoke in the wilderness. It's just this idea that the, you know, the iron horse is beginning to sort of make its way into popular culture. Um, this painting is not in the exhibition. This is George Innes, the Lackawanna Valley from um, the National Gallery of Art from 1856. Um, but I think it, it's a little more readable for that idea of smoke in the wilderness, um, where you begin to see even you know, the roundhouse and the sort of development of infrastructure. The first railroad charter, I should put a marker, marker down for you all, in the United States, the first railroad that is chartered in the United States, 1815. So that's kind of a, you know, the, the advance in technology, that's the starting point. We don't really see railroads for about another 15 years after that. And even when we do, they're kind of chugging along in the, in the background. They're not, they're not going economic um, concerns for another decade, um, at least or so. But referencing Machine in the Garden and Leo Marx and the fact that, you know, these sort of creatives are all in conversation together and they're all responding to the same, same changes in society, same changes in technology, um, I'd like to remind you all that when Henry David Thoreau went out to his cabin um, and wrote Walden, and which was published in 1854, in the background, if you remember, he, he comments on the train, frequently the train going from Concord to Boston back and forth. There's this kind of, you know, um, uh, I don't know, pace to the, to, the, to the book, which has to do with modernity and technology and the railroad. Um, and um, Thoreau, like so many of the other American authors of this period, directly um, commented, and this is from Walden, men have an indistinct notion that if they keep up this activity of joint stocks and spades long enough, all will at length ride somewhere, in next to no time and for nothing. But through a crowd rushes to the depot and the conductor shouts, all aboard, and this is of course where we got the title, when the smoke is blown away and the vapor condensed, it will be perceived that a few are riding, but the rest are run over. And it will be called and will be, quote, a melancholy accident, he wrote. So he's already issuing this warning, this kind of clarion warning about technology. Um, it was my kind of honor and privilege to get to know Leo Marx, who wrote that book um, as, a, um, as a young man. And I remember having lunch with him and kind of bemoaning my lot as a graduate student. Um, and he looked at me and said, you know, oh, Tom, every generation likes to think ours is the one that lost its innocence. 
you know, you're complaining about email, you're complaining about the fax machine, you know, your parents complained about something else, your grandparents complained about, um, you know, different conditions, your great grandparents complained about the railroad. Um, and so right there, you know, the, the kind of the great literary theorist and critic was commenting on Walden um, for us. Um, Kind of an apogee painting of this moment, and this is where things begin to get interesting in terms of the economic history of the United States. Um, Albert Bierstadt's View of Donner Lake from 1871, and this is from the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. This is with us for the summer in the, in the exhibition. Um, it's a little hard to see the railroad. Can anyone actually make out what's going on here? It's Donner Pass, Donner Lake, off in the distance. These are actually snow sheds. So they were actually protecting the track as it went through, and this is where the Transcontinental Railroad was eventually going to connect. Uh, I think it was 1869 after, after the Civil War. Um, what happened in Donner Pass just a couple of decades earlier? Oh, this is where the Donner Party came to a sticky end because of uh, the snow. So the, the railroad, which is a little bit hidden, or a little bit demure in this painting, is uh, actually you know, very advanced in that they were creating this sort of tunnel-like um, device to protect the, uh, to protect the tracks. Um, key, though, to this painting uh, is that point that we brought up a moment ago, which is if you look off in the distance, just kind of ignore the foreground and look into the mists of Donner Lake in the background, looks like the Garden of Eden to me. I mean, this is very much part of that uh, almost sort of propaganda that you get in visual culture, which is painting the West as something very, very desirable. So forget about the fact that a couple of decades earlier, people didn't make it through the, through the pass. Um, in this case, this is the promised land. Um, and if you take the train out West, this is what you will find, prosperity. Um, prior to this, during the gold rush, you had a long slog in a wagon, or you had to go all the way through Panama and dive uh, yellow fever along the way. But um, in this case, this is all about you know, technology leading you um, West. Um, Probably not a surprise to learn that a fellow named Collis Huntington commissioned this painting. Um, Collis Huntington was a railroad executive and major uh, investor in the railroad. So when you scratch the surface with Bierstadt's, with Frederick Church, and with these other students of Thomas Cole who paint the West and paint the railroad in particular as leading you to some promised land, almost invariably if you kind of run the you know, follow the money, as they say. If you follow the money back, you'll find it's, it's a railroad investor who's commissioned the painting. Um, and invariably, it's, you know, hanging in his office back in, back in Manhattan or somewhere. Um, so this, this kind of relationship between culture and capital, I think, is something we want to keep, keep in mind um, as well when we think about, think about these paintings. Um, now, this view of kind of you know, the manifest destiny, which we all learned you know, in high school was the kind of divine right of the United States to move west. Um, this was sort of, you know, fulfilling the economic and social uh, notion of progress in this country. Um, there are, of course, a lot of people who had a different idea about the notions of progress. Um, Theodore Kaufman was a sketch artist during the Civil War, 1861 to 1865. So like Winslow Homer, he was one of those uh, fellows who was embedded with the troops and sent his drawings back to be engraved. Um, therefore, he's actually quite good at telling a story, at creating a narrative in a painting, because he had to get an idea across to you, you know, in a very small, um, fairly limited um, media, which is that of the wood, the woodcut that would have been in the illustrated magazine of the 1860s. Um, so he takes his kind of narrative chops, or his narrative muscle, and in 1867, he paints Westward the Star of Empire. Um, and I think many of you have perhaps seen this painting. It's actually quite well known. It's in the collection of the St. Louis Mercantile Library, and it's, again, with us this summer um, for the exhibition. Um, it shows a group of indigenous uh, individuals over on the right, Native Americans, uh, engaged in an act of sabotage on this new, this new technology. They've lifted the rail, um, and they're about to um, uh, you know, cause this, this derailment. Um, striking to me, when we took this painting out of the crate and we put it on the wall, um, we had a heck of a time lighting it. It's a very dark painting. Um, and we have very sophisticated lighting in the Pizzagalli building at Shelburne Museum. You know, we can wash the wall, we can spot the painting in any way we, we want. Um, but this is a very difficult painting. And then we were all looking at that little, you know, headlight, headlamp in the distance. Um, and it took me a moment to realize that we're all used to that 
idea of the train coming down the tracks through the tunnel at us, and we are all, you know, very uh, sort of comfortable with the idea that that's a symbol of danger. But in 1867, very, very few people had seen that train bearing down on you. So the fact that Kaufman paints this in such a way that we are below the tracks, the picture you know, perspective is such that that train is about to roll right over us, is a really interesting gesture on the part of the artist. And it shows you know, his kind of skills as an illustrator, that this isn't just sort of telling a story of these disgruntled Native Americans who are taking down the iron horse, but he's actually pointing out that that train's about to roll right over you. Um, and I think it's a, it's a kind of a fascinating visual um, you know, technique, if you will, on the part, on the, part of um, the artist. Um, it also occurred to me that when we think of that headlight coming at us through the tunnel, you know, we, we kind of think Charlie Chaplin, don't we? I mean, you know that everything's going to be okay in the end. You know, it's sort of a gag when it's roaring down the tracks at you. Um, but in this case, um, and I, if you haven't seen the show or the painting, I encourage you to come stand in front of this painting. It's quite interesting. It's, it's a little threatening. Um, and, uh, and, you know, 1867, again, is a pretty early moment. I mean, we're kind of 30 years into this idea of the railroad and the American, American scene. Um, interesting to me, back to that comment, you know, every generation thinks ours is the one that lost its innocence. You know, very interesting to me, the fundamental change between the 1830s and let's say late 1860s, 1870, in perceptions of time and speed that are brought about by the railroad. Um, prior to the Civil War, fundamentally, this was an agrarian um, nation. Um, there was a historian named Robert Wiebe who talked about island communities, that there were lots of you know, cities and communities that were all knit together, but we weren't really an urban um, nation. We weren't really an industrial nation. By the time we get into the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and move toward the turn of the century, all of a sudden we are keeping railroad time. All of a sudden we're using punch clocks. You know, all of a sudden we have a very, very different way of understanding the rhythms of the day. And, tellingly, when thinking about this painting, we have a completely different um, concept of speed. 1867, when a painting like this um, is first displayed, um, any of us in this room, if we were standing in front of this painting, we had moved as fast as a horse in our lifetime. Our parents, perhaps, had been on a horse, but you know, could have been walking. So, you know, we were used to, you know, three, four, five, six, eight miles an hour, something like that. All of a sudden, we're doing 60, 70 miles an hour on a train. And if you read period newspapers from the 1870s and 80s, it's really pretty strange because almost every edition that you come across describes a train wreck, you know, railroad accident, or really bizarre, somebody stepping off of the train before the train gets into the station because people don't understand how fast the train is going. We literally, culturally, are not conditioned to thinking, you know, I better not step off the back of this train. Um, and um, time and time again, when we were doing research, we would find, you know, the mayor of, I don't know, Ottumwa, Iowa, or something like that, you know, came to, you know, came to the end of his days because he'd stepped off the cars, um, train cars, the trains were referred to as the cars. Um, very, very kind of odd thing in our worldview, but extremely prevalent if you read, read the newspapers of the era. Um, also this idea of how fast things moved in the 19th century. Um, those images that we saw before of Innes and Cole and kind of, you know, the promise of technology, you know, in the landscape, you know, yes, we're worried about this Garden of Eden with the, with the, um, um, with the engine in it, but, but, you know, generally up until this moment you have the notion that this is all, you know, for the good of the, you know, good of the country, good of the people. Um, this is another one of those fascinating paintings, William Robinson Lee's, the attempt to fire the Pitt Railroad, the Pittsburgh, um, excuse me, Pennsylvania Railroad um, from 1895. Um, Lee's dates are 1866, so right after the war to 18, 1955. So slightly different generation from Kaufman and some of the what people we've been talking about, painters we've been talking about before. Um, but Lee paints this in 1895. However, it's an illustration for a railroad strike from 1874, the Great Strike um, of 1874. And so we've gone f in 30, 40 years from this idea of you know, trains and technology being a positive good 
to now we're punching our time clock in the factory, we're unhappy with labor relations, and we're going to set fire to the roundhouse. So we have a riot, we have a, you know, a fight, a strike, which is put down by the militia. Um, the fact that Lee was painting this 20 years later um, fascinates me too. Um, you'll notice it's ungrisaille, so it's, it's painted basically in tones of gray, um, black and white. Um, and I, I telegraphed this a moment ago, or foreshadowed this a moment ago. Um, whenever you see a grisaille painting from the 19th century like this, as often as not, it was designed to be an illustration going into a magazine in the late 19th century. Um, this is the most exciting, up-to-date, sexy way of communicating information. This is the website of you know, the late 19th century, the illustrated magazine that shows up in the mail um, with you know, very dramatic um, depictions, you know, pictorial depictions of something that the author is, is uh, um, espousing, is, is, is uh, writing about. Um, Grisaille painting is basically shorthand. This is the artist is communicating with whoever is engraving the painting or making the photogravure. So it's an easier way of pointing out contrast. You know, they lit the train on fire, make that bright. Um, so fascinating to me that this sort of illustrator's technique has such kind of power and authority. Um, I was dwelling on this a little bit when we were installing the show. A lot of the people who are actually doing the engraving, so the artist paints the painting, sends it to New York, and there's someone who actually engraves it for the magazine, for Collier's or Harper's or Atlantic or whoever. Uh, those guys invariably, in the second half of the 19th century, are German immigrants. So there's even this kind of notion of, um, we're not even speaking the same language, so I'd better make it perfectly clear what I want um, when I'm painting this, uh, painting this scene. So both interesting in terms of the kind of technique and history of art and visual culture, but then also very, very interesting the fact that you know, all of a sudden we have great social unrest um, brought about by this new technology 30, 40 years into the, the history of the, of the uh, invention, or the adoption, I should say, of railroads. Just ticking past the turn of the century, and here we go with my kind of pendulum swing between you know, progress and nostalgia, if you will. Um, we could all also call it sort of progress and it discontents. Um, John Sloan, six o'clock winter. This is the Phillips collection. This is 1912, actually, 1911, 1912. I don't think we have the exact date. Um, Sloan, if you've heard of him or familiar with him, would have been the leader of what we eventually came to call the Ashcan School. Um, unlike the Hudson River School, the Ashcan School actually was a period term. Hudson River School is something that we've sort of imposed on the group of artists. No one actually thought they were in the Hudson River School in their own time period. But the Ashcan artists rather liked that title. It was, a, it was meant to be a snarky criticism of how they painted, and they liked it and they adopted it, because they were painting the sort of the gritty urban underbelly of New York City in this time period. Lower Manhattan, um, and I think the two Sloans we have in the exhibition, this is 1911, then there's one from I think 1922, really show this kind of positive sense of the heterogeneity of the city and also a very sort of positive notion of what this new mode of transportation um, offers to an urban uh, environment like Manhattan. Um, so I love the fact that it's kind of zoned where you get all the masses down kind of again at eye level with you. It's a little bit like that Kaufman, that way that he composes the painting to sort of put you in the crowd. Um, but then, you know, the elevated train is just taking off like a rocket ship over your head. So it's exactly the experience you would have um, in Lower Manhattan in this uh, in this time period. And of course, if you were to look at the the figures, they're very you know brushy. Um, Sloan um, essentializes or kind of um, makes it very very hard to read um, the features of the individuals. But you get the sense that you have uh, you know men and women and different ages and immigrants and. Um, it's kind of a wonderful case study in, in the throng or the crowd. Um, Sloan, born in 1871, so likely dies in 1950. So just that next generation um, of painters. Um, social realists, so they're very, very interested in, oh, um, you know, dance hall girls and, you know, Reginald Marsh and all these other um, painters from this time period, really kind of showing the full spectrum of what life was in, um, in Manhattan, lower Manhattan in this time period. There are other painters in this same time period, like Otto Kuhler, a German uh, immigrant who comes um, to the States, who start kind of 
stepping back a little bit from the scene. So, you know, Sloan put you right in the crowd. You can almost kind of, you know, smell the hot dog cart in, uh, in uh, Sloan's painting. Um, Kuhler stands way up above uh, um, um, Pittsburgh, and he paints this, Steel Valley, just a few years later, early 1920s, 1924 um, or so. And you begin to see uh, a couple of ships, and I probably should have called your attention to the sun and the Bierstadt, I'm sorry that I didn't do that, but if we were to go back and look at the Bierstadt, you would see a great sort of uh, veiled sun, um, like uh, you know, the sun's in the mist, it's like um, uh, Turner, William Turner in England painted these suns that really sort of popped out of the, out of the sky um, for you. Here, Cooler is doing kind of the same thing. He's giving you that Turner-like sun, but in this case, it's in smog, it's in smoke. So he's, he's kind of telegraphing to you that this is not a natural phenomenon um, that we're seeing, but in fact, it's the sort of the you know, belching smokestacks from these steam, steam factories. Um, fascinating to me that Kuhler, who again is just in this next generation, so born in the 1840s, excuse me, dies in the 1870s, um, he's painting throughout the teens and 20s, so things like this. Um, at the moment, we reach the apogee of the railroad in American culture, and I want to kind of put a big marker down on this. 1916, we hit uh, a quarter of a million miles of rail um, in the United States. 1920, so just maybe four years before this was painted, highest ridership, so passenger ridership, in the United States in this time period. So Kuehler is really showing us sort of, you know, how, um, you know, this modest industrial city from the 19th century, which may have had a few, you know, factories, has turned into, you know, the modern industrial powerhouse that, um, in this case, Pittsburgh was. Could have easily have been, you know, Detroit, and we'll talk about Detroit in a moment. So what Kuehler and this next generation of those sort of Ashcan and post-Ashcan artists do, um, is they're beginning to um, issue kind of warnings, if you will, these kind of clarion warnings about the environment. Um, and in the 1930s, again, we're past the high point of ridership, we're past the high point of actually building infrastructure in this country. So we're beginning to have a moment where, you know, again, that notion of there's some nostalgia creeping in, but there's also a critique, if you will, of the railroad. Um, this is Harry Gottlieb. This is called Dixie Cups. It's from the Wichita Art Museum from 1936, so right in the kind of heart of the Depression. Now, during the Depression, some people may have looked at this and said, great, industry, jobs, something's actually you know, at work in the United States, um, which is certainly very true. Um, but I find this kind of fascinating um, due to the very title, um, Dixie Cups. Everyone knows what a Dixie cup is? Um, these are, you know, immense railroad cars with these, um, um, you know, conical containers for moving slag out of um, uh, steel mills. So those are glowing red hot. Um, that's the byproduct of steel manufacture. And they would take them, you know, to the outskirts of town and tip them over and dump the, dump the byproduct um, out. Um, Fascinating, as we began to do a little bit of research into this painting um, for the catalog, Dixie Cups really come into the popular imagination in about 1919, 1920, after the Spanish flu. Um, so all of a sudden, we want disposable cups in washrooms. Um, and we were writing this essay, by the way, during the pandemic two years ago. So I was you know, really kind of fascinated by this notion of you know, public health changes and the fact that, you know, a Dixie cup by 1920 is viewed as something that's, you know, hygienic and going to help us, but 15 years later or so, it's being used as a kind of ironic um, term for these, these great, uh, um, uh, you know, waste uh, cars that are moving in and out of Detroit and Pittsburgh and other, other places. Um, these, of course, all lead us to, this is a fellow named Aaron Bowrod. This is, these are the slag heaps. This is from the collection of the Sheldon Museum. So um, in this time period, if you were on the outskirts of an industrial city, this is what you would see, are just these tremendous um, sort of byproducts of industrialization all brought to you by, by the railroad. Um, this is the time period um, where, again, um, you, know, you get a lot of interest in those writers like Hawthorne and um, Thoreau who are critiquing the railroad in the early um, part of the uh, 19th century, the 1840s or so. Um, 
you begin to get people teaching American literature on the sort of eve of World War II. Um, and so you get the rediscovery of Thoreau, you get the rediscovery of Hawthorne. Hawthorne wrote um, The Celestial Railroad in the 1840s. And um, if you can make it, we're gonna have an extraordinary lecture in October at the museum um, by a professor from Stanford on Hawthorne and the Railroad. I think it's gonna be a very magical, magical night. But this idea that we're rediscovering the critique of railroads from the very beginning in this moment where all of a sudden we're saying, well, wait a minute, has, you know, what has this done to the country, I think is important. Um, and I'll go back to Thoreau, and I'll go back to Walden. And he wrote, we do not ride on the railroad, it rides upon us. Um, did you ever think of those sleepers that are underlying the railroad? And by him, he means the, the ties. Each one is a man, the rails are laid on them, and they are covered with sand, and the cars run smoothly over them. They are sound sleepers, I assure you, and every few years a new lot is laid down and run over, so that if some have the pleasure of riding on a rail, others have the misfortune of being ridden upon. So this notion that both artists and writers are kind of offering this critique of the railroad um, and it's rediscovered each generation, I think is something that's very important to understand as well when thinking about how we created the visual kind of mythology of, of the railroad. Also, again, thinking of that pendulum back and forth, by the 1930s, we have a variety of sort of modes of visual representation. So we have those social realists like Gottlieb and um, Borod who are, are giving us, you know, um, literal views, figurative paintings. And then we have someone like George Alt here, um, and you don't see any figures. Um, so what you basically just see is this view um, from Brooklyn Heights of the Manhattan, Manhattan skyline, and you get, you know, the railroads as they come down to the docks. Um, and it's all about geometry, because by this point, we really have a, a strong influx of European modernism, and so there are all these different sort of ways in which artists have. It's like they have a new toolkit, if you will, for describing um, modernity and, and the railroad. And um, this is in the exhibition. This one isn't. Um, I think there's three or four in this presentation that aren't, but this is um, Charles Sheeler's classic landscape from the National Gallery of Art, um, 1931. I guess this is the second National Gallery painting I've showed you that isn't in the exhibition, and that may say something about the National Gallery's willingness to lend their paintings. Um, but um, this is the River Rouge plant um, in 1931. So this is where Model A Fords are being produced. And then 10 years later, this is where aircraft are being produced during World, World War II. Um, here again, it's, you know, we often refer to this as precisionism. This is kind of a form of modernism. Um, it's a little bit um, chilly, if you will. Um, the critic Lincoln Kirstein called um, Sheeler one of the frigid air school of American paintings um, because of the sort of the icy, icy palette and icy um, way in which he uh, described the scene in front of you. Like Alt, you'll see there are no figures. Um, and whenever you kind of don't see the human form, that's usually kind of a, uh, oh, uh, you know, a little bit of a indicator that we're, we're, you know, we're questioning technology, we're questioning kind of humanity and the humane response to this technology. Um, I find this so interesting because as you move into the Depression, this is just two years after the stock market crash, you begin to really get this kind of coolness to the images that you see. And so we called this section of the exhibition the Lonely Rail. Um, because you don't get the figures, you just get the sort of the very frank view of um, technology. I think this is foreshadowing, this is a prescient image, because we only have about another 20 years or so before railroads come into tremendous uh, financial problems. They're already in crisis during the Depression, and Roosevelt, FDR, basically creates a railroad czar to force all the separate, disparate companies to work together. Um, he almost socializes, almost um, takes over the, um, um, the grid, the railroad grid, um, but he doesn't do it. He just kind of creates this situation where they have to work together. Um, by the 1950s, however, it's really not working because we have the Eisenhower Highway System eventually by the 1960s and 70s, um, and the automobile has basically replaced the train for the, really the, the prime mover in American society of this era. So this um, you know, kind of monumental, it's a large painting if you've seen it at the National Gallery, um, uh, this monumental sort of painting, which is about industry, you know, sort of in questioning industry, is also, you know, kind of has the, the end of the story or the, the moral to the story in the, um, in the in, you know, encoded in it, embedded in it, because automobiles are about to take over um, for sure. 
this notion of the lonely rail um, you know, comes on very strong in Edward Hopper's Approaching a City. This is from the Phillips Collection. This is 1946, right after um, the end of World War II. Um, a friend of mine, when I was talking about this painting earlier, just said, well, you know, Edward Hopper can make anything seem lonely. Um, <laughs> it's not, this isn't, shouldn't be a surprise. But th this is where, if any of you are familiar with the topography of Manhattan, this is where the commuter trains come into Park Avenue and go, go underground on their way to, to Grand Central. So this, this is about, um, you know, what happens after the war as people are coming in and out from Connecticut and Westchester and, you know, to work, work in the city. Um, here again, Hopper, like Sheeler and all, no people. So this is a very, you know, cold, frank, kind of stark um, scene. Um, I read a lot of these paintings after the war, which, you know, really are existential in this regard, um, as being about the Cold War. Um, this is really about an era when, you know, the whole world can change in an instant. Um, and so it's a, you know, it comes across as sort of a frightening painting. Um, all the more so when you get to something like George Tooker, the subway from 1950. This is at the Whitney. Um, this isn't with us, sadly. It's going to be in the, the, the next venues of the exhibition when it gets to the, the Dixon and the Jocelyn. Um, Tooker's actually a Vermont painter. Lived in southern, southern Vermont and then um, painted in New York City. But, you know, here he's taken, uh, you know, the subway and rendered it kind of terrifying. Um, and by 1950, we would have all been into our, you know, duck and cover, uh, understanding that the subways are bomb shelters. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, Tooker is often called a magical realist because he's telling these sort of narratives, in this case, a kind of a terrifying narrative of life underground in the subway. And um, you know, the fact that all these men are looking at this woman and you can't quite understand the dynamic um, adds to the, the unease that we as the visitor um, have from this um, painting. Um, but I think, again, a lot of this after the war, this, this notion that you know, society has changed now that we're in the atomic era um, and increasingly in the sort of the automobile um, era as well. Um, I'll swing, you know, back and forth just to kind of show you in a couple of slides, you know, where we were in the early part of the century. And I'll just, I will toggle this. So this is 1950. This is the subway in 1912. So again, that notion of, you know, progress and the critique on progress that we toggle back and forth. This is Samuel Wolfe, 1912. Um, he called it the underworld. So that's interesting. So I mean, he's already kind of saying this is you know, Hades or this is, you know, this is, uh, but, um, but it's in fact quite a, you know, warm and inclusive painting. Um, you've got the, the swells over there on the left, um, the woman in her, her finery, and we'll talk about her again in a moment. And then we've got the messenger boy who's going to bring you your telegram, and we've got the immigrant couple over there with their baby. And then um, when you come see the exhibition, or those of you who have seen it, you'll notice that, you know, the guy reading the newspaper shows up constantly. You know, this is just part of, you know, what do you do on the subway? Well, you read your paper. So I love the fact that he's actually cut off. So it sort of, again, puts you in the picture plane. You are almost the fellow reading the newspaper, kind of looking in on this car and all of the, uh, all of the change. Um, now, the woman is kind of interesting to me um, over there. When I was first doing a little bit of research, I said, oh, well, she's just kind of dressed for, dressed for the evening. Um, but it turns out she was literally dressed for the evening. Um, and uh, you know, that kind of symbolism would, would give you, in this time period, a very clear indicator that this is a, you know, what would have been called a fast, fast woman or loose woman in the time period. Um, and I want to read another quote from uh, a, um, an author, in this case, Theodore Dreiser, Sister Carrie, um, 1900, often called the first modern novel. Um, and if you've read Sister Carrie or remember Sister Carrie, the scenes change in the novel at the end of every chapter on the railroad. Um, Carrie, the book starts off on the first page, and Carrie from this little town in Wisconsin is on her way by the train to take the train to Chicago. Um, and then, of course, this traveling salesman leans over and starts talking her up and you know, offering all sorts of things for when she gets to the big city. And so Dreiser writes of this moment, when a young woman leaves home, she either falls into saving hands or she rapidly assumes the cosmopolitan standard of virtue. Um, so Dreiser was very clearly critiquing the fact that young women are now taking the train far from home, away from familial bonds and ties and mores and expectations off to the big city. And of course, Carrie ends up, you know, carrying on with this um, um, traveling salesman and then somebody else. And then I think there was a third gentleman involved in the, 
the picture. And so whenever the scene changes, they're on a train going someplace else. Why it's the modern novel, why it's so very interesting, is you all remember that the men all end up um, destitute in the flop house, and Carrie ends up the star of the Broadway stage. So 20 or 30 years earlier, if Carrie was carrying on with these men on the train and leaving home, she would have ended up you know, a prostitute in the flop house, but she actually comes out on top, and it's the men who end up sort of dissolute. And uh, um, so it's, it's a very, very modern morality story, if you will, very unlike anything that would have happened 10 or 20 years um, earlier. A uh, couple of last images. Um, I'm fascinated always by regional difference. Um, Boston, just about the same time period, Edmund Tarbell's in the station. So here's New York, here's Boston. You know, Boston always has this kind of quiescence and this uh, homage to history and the past and filial piety. This is a very, very unusual Tarbell because if you're familiar with Edmund Tarbell's work, he's usually painting these very proper interiors, you know, Beacon Hill parlors that have all of these ancestral objects in them. So 18th century high chests and China trade vases. Um, this is very unusual because it's public sphere. Tarbell very rarely paints. Um, something like this. But what I find so interesting is, you know, while the rest of the nation is turning into that earlier uh, painting we saw of Pittsburgh, industrial cities, you know, painting like this kind of reminds us, don't worry, Boston will always be this quiescent historic place where women in the summertime will wear white dresses and it will, it will all be fine. Um, so I like the, the regional difference that you see as well in this time period. We've kind of gotten away from, you know, really understanding regional difference in this country. Um, and it used to be like so dialed in to you know, city to city. You could always tell, if you look at, for instance, John Singer Sargent, the painter Sargent, the sitters from Boston and New York and London, they all look different. Um, so the fact that the artist was, had a social antenna and was responding to how people you know, behaved in these cities. Now, you know, we still have a lot of this in play, but, but it isn't perhaps as dramatic as we saw in this era. I like continuing with Boston for a moment. Um, this is Alan Rohan Kreit, um, the car stop from Boston Athenaeum from 1940. Um, I had the pleasure to meet Alan Kreit um, when he was in fairly advanced age back in the 90s. Um, we were borrowing another one of his paintings and his daughter brought him to explain it to me. And it was really a wonderful um, hour that I spent with him. Um, he was African American, had put himself through Harvard Extension School and became a draftsman at the Charlestown Navy Yard. So one of the very, very few African-American professionals that you would have found in the early 20th century in Boston. Um, and what he said, and I'll paraphrase slightly, is we're used to the kind of Harlem Renaissance um, uh, artists, Jacob Lawrence and others, we're used to um, artists that are painting um, you know, African-Americans in a slightly caricatured way. This is Palmer Hayden, who was himself black, um, but was basically uh, sort of trading in the mythology of John Henry. So he was taking an old, um, you know, an old folk song and updating it for the 20th century. And he was basically, um, you know, providing this myth for a white audience. Um, and what um, Alan, Crohan, Alan Rohan Kreit said to me, excuse me, Kreit, is he said, yeah, I didn't want to paint what he called the jazz Negro. He said, I wanted to paint the real Negro. I wanted to paint my neighbors. It was, and he was using this, you know, archaic terminology um, but what he was doing was basically creating this sort of humanity for his neighborhood. And if you look at each of these figures, you can just tell that you know, they're his neighbors, they're his friends, they're the shopkeeper, there's everyone that you will find. Very different from, you remember when we looked at the John Sloan earlier where you just get kind of faces in the crowd. This is Kreit painting his neighborhood. Um, there's gonna be a major Kreit exhibition, um, I think it's next year or the year after at the MFA Boston, and I've been frankly waiting for 30 years for someone to do Alan Kreit, because he painted, he was very um, prolific. He painted a lot of these, you know, what he called the kind of the neighborhood scenes. Um, so it's a whole kind of history of black Boston from the, the first um, half of the 20th century, which is gonna be wonderful. Um, all of it leads to here, and I'll, I'll end with Thomas Hart Benton, The Engineer's Dream, um, 1931, and this is in the, in the exhibition. Um, the mythology of the railroad. We are very used to thinking of, you know, images like that Palmer Hayden view of John Henry. We're very used to this notion of manifest destiny. We're very used to thinking, you know, perhaps not very critically about the railroad and how it changed 
American culture. It moved us from the farm to the city, not just literally, but also in terms of just cultural and economic forces. Um, but in the case of something like this, this is almost a, you know, a, we probably saw a work like this in a high school history book. And we didn't think you know, terribly critically about you know, Benton and what he was doing. He moved from the Midwest to New York to be a, you know, sort of a spokesperson for the middle, middle America, an aesthetic, artistic spokesperson. Um, and he created a series of these railroad disaster paintings. So just as I mentioned earlier, in the 1860s and 70s, you would open the newspaper and you would read about you know, the 945 ran into the 947 because someone didn't flip the switch. Um, in this case, Benton traded in that notion of these railroad accidents when he created these great mythic paintings. Um, so in this case, it's the engineer's dream, and you see the engineer there on the right. It's probably his nightmare. Um, I think it's, in fact, him jumping from the locomotive. He's being flagged down, um, and he's not going to make it, so he, you know, he bails out of the train. Um, two years after the stock market crash, so you know, this is probably a you know, metaphor, a parable, um, for the United States in general. Um, in this time period. Um, but when you see paintings like this, um, and when you see views of, or another Sheeler, if you will, rolling power, this is at Smith College, there's another one at the Fine Arts Museum in San Francisco. When you see things like this that seem to depict, um, you know, the authority and the promise and the kind of power of the, of the railroad, you want to stop and think about, you know, all these other narratives that are encoded in the paintings that the artists, in dialogue with writers were you know, leaving for us as narratives throughout this sort of 100-year period between 1830s and 1950 or so, 120 years. Um, because it turns out that the story is a lot more complicated than, than we thought. And um, when you see the exhibition, if you haven't, I think you know, you'll see that there's a very, very broad spectrum of response to the railroad on the part of creatives. And the fact that, again, these painters were in dialogue with the technology from the very beginning, both promoting it in the case of Bierstadt um, and then critiquing it in the case of Gottlieb, um, you'll see that it's a very, you know, it's a very rich and contested history. Thank you. All right? That's a painting. So it's a good question because Scheler was also a photographer. So he framed the view very much like you know, a modern photographer would. Um, but, um, and then he often gridded off photographs and would paint them. Um, a lot of painters in the early 20th century didn't like to admit they were doing that. But they all were. Um, tech, you know, photography after a certain point became um, you know, an accepted way of sketching the scene. Whereas you know, 50 years earlier, you would have sketched it or used watercolors and then painted it. Um, photography, by the time Scheler came along, was a, you know, viewed as an, a, sort of an accepted preparatory medium. But then if you wanted to be taken seriously, you had to paint it. You had to be a painter. So that's Question. another whole conversation Question? is the, the, the sort of fight for photography as a um, artistic medium between like 1895 and World War II. And there are you know, magazines founded and that have, you know, contradictory editorial opinions with each other over, you know, are you a camera operator, which sounds like, you know, machine operator, or are you a photographer, which sounds like an artist? So it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a fun, fun discussion. But happy to take questions, talk myself in and out of any trouble that I got into. Questions for anyone? Okay. Hi, the, uh, the history of the uh, Railroad seems to have been evolved differently in Europe, at least in the modern yes, era. Yes, it did. <laughs> and, and I guess my question is, do you, do you have any knowledge of, uh, of what the artistic depictions of that uh, have been in Europe, and how would that contrast with what we saw here today? Yeah, no, it's wonderful. I actually took my kids to Scandinavia um, just a few weeks ago, and we didn't rent a car. Um, I've been in England with my kids, and you know, I don't particularly like driving on the other side of the <laughs> streets. So, um, just look at a railroad map in Europe in compared to today, particularly with passenger passenger rail. Um, you know, you get from one small town to the next on the on the train, and, and it works. It all works quite well. Um, now, the creative response, your question, it starts the same. 
Um, and if you go into the memorial building at Shelburne Museum, you see the Impressionist paintings. There's the Charing Cross Railroad Bridge by Monet there. I mean, if you really squint, you can see that there's a train puffing across the bridge. Um, so that, that idea of you know, capturing modernity was something that Monet was very interested in with that painting. Um, Turner painted that great um, sort of engine roaring right at you, belching um, steam, probably in the 1850s or 60s. William Millard Turner. Um, where did it go? Um, not in the same trajectory as the states. So, you know, we, we tended to critique the railroad, I think, a little more than they did. And then because they preserved and improved and expanded the railroads, it has a more, I think, generally positive um, visual representation, and then I would offer the fact that so many railroads got destroyed twice in two war wars. World War One, World War Two probably had a huge impact, which it didn't in in this country. We came back from World War Two and adopted the automobile, and you know looked at the autobahn in Germany and said, "Well, that's the future. We'll, we'll move trucks around in cars." So. Question in back, yeah. Very uh, informative. It, 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 I like what you have done with us. Uh, I, my question has a kind of historical sweep to it. Whereas you have conveyed the artist as a painter of, te uh, of in, rooted in history and making editorial comments about the advent of technology and what it's doing to to the Garden of Eden. So People and environment yeah, and yes, the garden. Environment yeah. and technology yep. and its evils and and so. It made a kind of a, I had a kind of an aha moment. Of, uh, it made me think: Has that always been true in the big sweep of history? Have, I mean, I, I have tended to think of artists as coming to a canvas to create beauty and perhaps moral and spiritual uplift or something. But, but uh, they're not necessarily incompatible. But I, I wonder if you would comment on on the importance of of this kind of painting making social critique in yeah. contrast to previous eras. At any moment in history. If you lined up 10 people with a brush or a pencil, you're going to get you know, a spectrum of response. Um, so some people believe they're there to create beauty. Some people there are there to poke you in the eye and ask you to see the world in a slightly different manner. Um, so it's um, where I find kind of interesting is these unspoken connections between, we said, culture and capital. The fact that Collis Huntington and all his friends are commissioning Bierstadt to paint paintings that look like the Garden of Eden. Um, so a lot of people look at them and say they're beautiful. Um, but a lot of people, as they became known and worked their way into sort of visual culture, as people saw them in museums later on, um, you know, may or may not understand the, uh, the rhetorical aspect of the work, if you will, the fact that it has a point of view. Um, um, I will say, it was a, I'm not sure I could find very many paintings to show you that are just unabashedly, you know, beautiful railroad scenes. Um, years ago, I worked on a project at the Smithsonian called Picturing Old New England. And, um, you know, landscape, coast of Maine, um, you know, all this kind of, you know, the presidential range in New Hampshire. You know, there are all these different New Englands that show up in the American imagination. I think we all talked about this at some point a couple of years ago. Um, but we spent a lot of time trying to find painters who were providing like a, a counter narrative to this idea of New England. Um, very, very hard to find a painting of a factory. Um, very hard to find paintings. You know, you can find these, these railroad scenes that show kind of technology coming into the garden, but you never really see the garden like bespoiled by technology in New England. You do elsewhere. You do in Detroit or Pittsburgh, um, but not, not in New England. Um, so I don't know if that's sort of an answer to your question. Um, and actually, the painting I have in my head is the Willimantic Connecticut um, Thread Factory by Willard Metcalf. He paints this very beautiful yellow, yellow factory building. Um, and I always love, there was this letter that Metcalf wrote to a friend. He says, well, I've been out um, you know, painting these scenes in Connecticut. And, and um, 
I call it hollyhocking, he said. Um, if I ever saw something I didn't like in the scene, I just painted a hollyhock in front of it. <laughs> so that was how he got rid of you know, telegraph wires or poles or any kind of infrastructure he didn't like. He just painted hollyhocks in front of it to, to, to you know, naturalize the scene and make it, you know, make it look like New England. Willard Metcalf. He said, I've been out hollyhocking. <laughs> yes? Um, coming. Yes. Oh, sorry, <laughs> um, this might be two questions. Um, so you, you're up to what point in time are you here? This is your ending with this. Oh, Scheler is, um, he's painting these as early as the 30s. I, f I think this is right before World so War II. So I guess my question was that if you sent, are there any artists that go out now? I mean, if you go one or two or three decades. Forward, yeah. Would you find anything So in the exhibition, we went through the sort of 1950s, and it, it kind of ends with a woman named Kay Sage. Um, and Kay Sage is really interesting. She was the daughter of a lumber baron from Albany, New York. So all the you know, wood coming out of the Adir Adirondacks her father was controlling as it goes to build Manhattan. And she and her mother take off for Paris, which is what you do in the 1920s, if you have. And um, she marries an Italian count, divorces him 10 years later, says it was the most boring decade of her life, <laughs> um, takes up with a French surrealist painter goes to all of the early surrealism exhibitions in Paris in the 1920s and 30s, comes back to Connecticut and starts painting these surrealist visions of the world, you know, very kind of disturbing, a little more so than that Tooker painting, you know, where the picture plane kind of decays in front of you and doesn't make much sense. Um, and so she painted a railroad bridge. Um, and so we borrowed that painting. It's at the New Brit from the New Britain Museum of American Art. But so you get that. I mean, and particularly after the war where like everything's up for grabs, like, you know, what, We've just been through the most horrific thing, you know, imaginable, and you know, cities are destroyed in Europe, and she kind of, her painting is sort of referencing that, but in a very, very up-to-date and modern way, which is it's you know, tricking the eye. Um, so I guess that would be my answer, which is, um, you know, the, the march toward abstraction and abstract expression. By the 1950s, you're not supposed to be painting something that looks like what you're viewing. It's just it's you know, pure emotion, pure you know, Jackson Pollock. And so Kay Sage, who's sort of a latter-day surrealist in the 1950s, would be kind of what you would see 20 years after this. And the other question, I guess, sh hopefully short question, is that working? There you um, go. Is cog railroads, because those yeah. are kind of cute and romantic. They there. are. You know, I what happened? Yeah. Did anybody paint those? Yes, and so back to that, that idea of, um, um, that picturing New England show I worked at at the Smithsonian, we had a, a painting of the Cog Railroad going up Mount Washington. Because we, we spent a lot of time thinking about Mount Washington and the presidential range. And in the mid 19th century, if you were a painter and you wanted to be taken seriously, you had to paint Niagara Falls, Mount Washington, the coast of Maine. They're places where you go and like make your, make your bones, make your reputation. And, um, I love the fact that by you know the 18, I forgot, 60s or 70s, the infrastructure for going up Mount Washington and not having to hike it is there with the Cog, Cog Railway. Um, they had them for a little, for Anderson too, they would go up to the mountain and sure. mining or something? Um, sure, yeah, all sorts of industrial railroads like that, the Dixie Cups, and, um, but um, the railroad in New England is interesting, you know, in general, the, Tracks are going north-south because we're taking um, raw material south, mostly charcoal. So you know, you burn off the landscape here, you make charcoal, you take it down to southern New England for the early iron industry in the 1830s and 40s. And then um, Civil War, you're moving men and supplies south out of New England. And then almost immediately after the war, 1865, um, I found this map years ago. Um, and it shows the, um, all the railroad tables taking you, you know, to vacation in New Hampshire and Maine right after the war. So there's this notion that the, you know, the war is so traumatic that New England, which is um, you know, considerably depopulated after the war, the men either got killed and didn't come back or just didn't come back because they moved to the city after the Civil War. New England becomes vacation land you know, immediately after the Civil War. 
Um, so, you know, the, the, the technology and infrastructure that had an economic, an initial economic rationale for moving goods south turns around and moves people north to create a tourist economy for Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. After the Civil War, you know, the, these three states provide more troops per capita to the Union Army than the rest of the country. After the Civil War, you know, sheep farming goes elsewhere. We don't really have an economy in Vermont, so it, it becomes a tourist economy. Same with Maine. Thank you. This was terrific. Sure. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you very have much. Have a wonderful weekend.